Welcome to Hinsdale Field Lab. This is the lesson preview and this is lesson number three for January 15, 2022. Today we are going to talk about the supremacy of Jesus as um, the author of the letter to the Hebrews presented in that letter type uh, sermon. So we are going to see how Jesus is presented as uh, being higher and better than many other uh, beliefs that the, the people in, in this uh, author's times uh, happen. As far as uh, who was the author, we have already spoken about that, and uh, we strongly believe that it was the Apostle Paul who wrote the letter to the Hebrews. So we are going to see a uh, few things that are pretty interesting and pretty uh, deep as well, so uh, you better uh, have... Uh, or pay attention to this so we can have a, a, a better understanding and we can enjoy this wonderful lesson. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us today and thank you for your word because always, always we have something to learn from it and it's always a blessing to our lives. Help us to be uh, uh, wise and apply it to our everyday life so that way we can uh, take the most uh, or the most advantage from it. Thank you for being with us. Bless us with understanding from heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the title of the lesson is The Promised Son. And um, if you remember, uh, once Adam and Eve uh, sinned, uh, God promised a seed which was a son who will redeem them from their guilt, recover the ruling of the world, and defeat the serpent. Let's break this down. After Adam and Eve sinned, uh, they were in a position that uh, was kind of a danger. That was the, the worst thing could uh, they go, uh, they could go through. Why? Because remember that God said that uh, if they eat of the fruit, uh, they were going to die. And we know that they didn't die immediately, but they started to die even because eventually they died. It happened probably 900 years later, but eventually they died. So the thing is, in order to, uh, for them, have a different chance, because when they were created, they were created perfect. So Life had no end at that moment for them. But after they sinned, now life had an end. So in order for them to overcome this uh, death, um, the Lord promised that they will send a son, someone who will come through them and they will have a second chance. So the thing is, they believed it will be one of their kids. So when Cain was born, they, they, they thought that he was the, the promised son, but it happened that he wasn't. Then Abel was born, and they thought, baby, this is going to be the one. And it happened that he wasn't either. So after uh, Cain and Abel had that disagreement and, and Cain killed uh, Abel, they grieved, and they had a different son. This was Seth. And they thought, this is the one that is going to redeem us from the guilt. And uh, they were going to recover the ruling of the world. Because remember that one of the things that the Lord said to them was that they had to have dominion over all the creation. But once they sinned, they were expelled from, from, from uh, the Garden of Eden. And now they had to work harder for their own uh, uh, food. I mean, for their own sustaining. So, so um, all the ruling of, of the world and the dominion that they could have, they, they lost it. Because now they were afraid from some of the beasts of the, of the uh, field. While before, the beasts were obedient to them. So now... The, the, the roles changed and Satan, the serpent, became the ruler of the world. Remember that when Jesus was being tempted, uh, Satan 
uh, uh, said to Jesus, I, all, all these kingdoms are mine and I, I, and I can give it to whoever I want. If you worship me, I'm going to give them to you. So Satan self-proclaimed the ruler of the world. So they were expecting someone who would take back the ruling of the world. So they thought Seth would be the one. And it happened that Seth wasn't either. Uh, the other thing that they uh, wanted to uh, see was the defeating of the serpent because they knew that they were trapped. They were uh, deceived by the serpent who happened to be Satan. And uh, they wanted to see the serpent being defeated. So they didn't, didn't have the son who would do all those things. Uh, and this is a, a quote from uh, The Desire of Ages, page uh, 30, 31. And it says, when Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. They wanted to see the fulfillment pretty quick. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. But the fulfillment of the promise tarried. So it wasn't Cain, nor Abel, nor Seth. So the promise was later confirmed. To Abraham, God swore to him that he will have a seed, a son, through whom all nations of the earth will be blessed. So, of course, God did not forget the promise that he made to Adam and Eve. And we're talking about several hundreds of years. We're talking about I want to say like a couple, hundred, a couple thousand of years after Adam and Eve, Abraham appears in the scene and the Lord promised him that he will have a son who will be the instrument to bless all the nations of the world. Same promise, pretty much. Different context or different um, approach um, with Adam and Abraham. But the Lord did not forget his promise and now he confirmed the promise to Abraham using the same term seed uh, both for Adam and, and Abraham so everyone was looking forward to the fulfillment of that promise remember that even um, God calls Isaac the son of the promise uh, when he was being compared to Ishmael who was born um, uh, from Abraham uh, to Agar, or from Agar to Abraham. And, um, and, and he was, at the end, he was a, a son of Abraham. But the Lord said, no, your, your son, your only one, he says, is Isaac. He is the son of the promise. So that gave some kind of a faith and confidence and, and hope to Abraham thinking that he will be able to see the fulfillment of the promise in his son. But it wasn't Isaac either, not even the sons of Isaac, which were Esau and Jacob, who later on was renamed as Israel. So the promise was still there, waiting for the fulfillment. Now we go another thousand years and God did the same with David. He promised David that his descendant will be installed by God as his own son and will be established as righteous ruler, as a righteous ruler over all the kings of the earth. So pay attention to this. He promised David that his descendant, the descendant of David, will be installed by God as his own son, as God's own son. So the promise was still there. Now we're, we're talking about uh, 3,000 years after Adam and Eve. Promise was still waiting for the fulfillment. But now something else was added up to the promise. He is going to be the ruler, the ruler of the world. Recovering the ruling of this world, the Lord promised um, David, the greatest king of Israel, that his own son will be called my own son, by God and will sit in his throne to rule all the nations of the world. So initially David thought it was Solomon because Solomon um, reigned 
after after David, so he thought maybe Solomon is going to be the one. But in the in the same text, the Lord mentions that uh, his son will commit some kind of iniquity, and and he will forgive him. So then we understood, and we understand now also that it wasn't Solomon the one who was going to fulfill this promise made to King David. Um, so now let's talk about the fulfillment of the promise. What neither Adam and Eve. Abraham nor David probably ever imagined, however, was that their Redeemer's son would be God himself. Let's think about this. Adam was thinking that one of his children was going to be the Redeemer. Abraham thought that Isaac or any of his children, because he had more children after Ishmael, he had Isaac, and then uh, Sarah died, and he remarried, and he had more children, will be uh, the Redeemer. No, none of them. David thought initially that Solomon was going to be the Redeemer, and he wasn't the Redeemer either. They never thought that it was going to be God himself, the Redeemer. So now, how we reconciliate the, the, the fact that God himself was the Redeemer, uh, with all these promises that he was going to be a descendant from these three guys, Adam, Abraham, and David. So uh, imagine being, in a, in, uh, being a Christian in the first century. Let's think about that. Being a Christian in the first century. As a normal person, being a Jew, you have all kind of uh, problems. Let's like we have every single day today with uh, different different kind of problems today because we we live in the 21st century we have problems with technology we have problems with, uh, with uh, connection we have problems with uh, 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 kids going to college or, or school trying to buy a home or paying all the, the the utilities and the bills that we receive every single day at home different kind of problems what kind of, kind of car I, I want to drive all those things but being a Jew in the first century, you will have any kind of problems as well. Not these problems that we have today, but the problems for that age. Um, but being a Christian was a different challenge. Because being a Christian added up some problems to your normal and daily life. As a Jew, they had the assurance of God being the God. Of, of the nation and being the savior, being the one who did all these promises and they were just waiting for the fulfillment of these promises. Now, being a Christian, like I said, was a different challenge because all these, you, you carry all the, the, the problems or, or the challenges being a Jew. Now, being a Christian, you were going to be persecuted you're going to suffer of uh, uh, doubt because uh, after uh, Jesus being ascended to heaven, uh, they didn't see him no more. And, and, and now after a few years, all the persecution, all the promises that were not fulfilled at that moment, all the, the accusation and the pointing of the people, all the, the, the things that people uh, used to murmur and said, they, they, they were uh, just uh, hammering and hammering in their minds. So now the doubts were growing bigger and bigger and, and more in number. So they needed some kind of assurance. And that's why the author, like I said, we strongly believe that was the Apostle Paul, writes this letter trying to assure their faith, trying to confirm what they believe and trying to um, affirm that Jesus was God himself. So let's read this. That's Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3. Actually, I guess it was, yeah. But in these days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appoint, appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe, the Son, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact, exact representation of his being. So remember that in the first uh, verse of uh, Hebrews, 
he says that the Lord has spoken through the prophets uh, in many ways in, and also in the past. But now, he says, in these days or in the last days, he has spoken by his son. Now, let's try to uh, understand this text by looking a little bit closer. The prophets used the expression last days or latter days to talk about the future in general. For example, Deuteronomy 4.30 and 31 and Jeremiah 23 and 20. We're not going to uh, check those texts because uh, we know what we're talking about. The prophet Daniel used a second expression, the time of the end, which is not the same as this uh, last days or latter days. And he used the expression, the time of the end, to talk more specifically about the last days of earth's history, as appears in uh, Daniel chapter 8, 17, and also in 12, 4. So let's uh, try to understand this. In these last days is the fulfillment of the last days or latter days prophesied by the prophets. So let's, let's try to understand. When the author of Hebrews says, in these last days, He's referring to the last days and the latter days prophesied by the prophets. So that's the fulfillment of these latter days and last days. So when Paul wrote to the Hebrews, he's saying, this is the last days, or these are the last days the prophets prophesied. But is not the fulfillment of the time of the end prophesied by Daniel. How is it? Because... Remember that the, the author of Hebrews wrote that letter or sermon or letter, uh, sermon type letter uh, 2,000 years ago. And by that time, the last days began or, or they began with the coming of Jesus, the first coming of Jesus. But the time of the end is closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that's the difference. So we have to have this clear in mind. I don't want to spend more time on this because I know that we can get it uh, not so complicated. I want to focus more in the supremacy of Jesus Christ. So the fulfillment of the promise. Long ago, uh, this is the same verse, uh, uh, same verses, but in a different version. This is the standard or the English Standard Version. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. These are big words, and let's try to understand. For Judaism, if you were a Jew at the time of this um, uh, people in the time of Jesus in, in, in the first century. There was something that they uh, uh, were confident of and, and that brought so much assurance to them. And that was the existence of God. They strongly believed in the existence of God and also that the act or the fact actually that God speaks in the beginning according to Genesis 1, 1 2, 3. In the beginning, God created. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed the D. And God said. God created and God said. Okay? Remember, things came to existence because of the word of God. In the Christianism era, so this is what, what Paul is trying to assure in the people. Jesus is God. So they had to understand that Jesus himself is God, as, as the existence of God. And also that Jesus speaks because, let's go back a little bit. Now, God spoke to the fathers, that's in the past, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So, if Jesus speaks and he is God himself, they had the same assurance that the Jews had before the time of Jesus Christ. He created the world and he Speaks. Jesus created the world and he speaks because that's what uh, Paul says. He has spoken to us by his own, who he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Talking about Jesus Christ. So that was meant to bring assurance to the people 
in the time of the church, uh, of, of the Hebrew, uh, the new converted to Christian uh, to Christianism, the Jews who were converted to Christianism. So uh, they needed to have the same assurance that, that all Hebrew people had before the time of Jesus Christ. If God existed and God speaks, then I am confident that I, that I, I can listen to his word because all the, the, the writings of the prophets are his word, are God's word. They went through a period of uh, 400 years when the last uh, prophet, to put something in writing. I'm not saying that he was the last prophet appointed by God and that before Jesus, and, and I mean, after Malachi, and before Jesus, there was not a prophet. No, I'm not saying that. There was not in writing um, the word of God. So the writing was closed, basically, at the moment Malachi uh, wrote his, uh, his book. And, and then another 400 years until the coming of Jesus Christ. So... Uh, they had that assurance that that was the word of God. So now Paul is saying, in these last days, in these times, God has spoken through his son, Jesus Christ. And through him, he created all things. So what brought assurance to the Jewish people, now how to bring assurance as well to the Christian people, and seeing Jesus as the true God. So he is the fulfillment of the promise made to or the promise made to uh, Adam, Abraham, and David. Jesus Christ, being God Himself, He fulfilled that promise. Um, the story. This is something that um, says F. F. Bruce in in a book uh, that he uh, commentary of the. Uh, Epistle to the Hebrews. He says, the story of divine revelation is a story of progression up to Christ, but there is no progression beyond him. What he's trying to say is this, that Jesus is the, re uh, the revelation of the Father. He came to reveal the Father. He said to Philip, you remember when Philip uh, asked uh, Jesus, hey, uh, teacher, just show us the Father and, and then we, we will believe. And Jesus said, I've been with you guys all this time for more than three years. And now you're asking me to show you the father who has seen me, has seen the father because he came to reveal the father. Remember that uh, in another part of the Bible says no one has seen God ever. The father has never been seen for anyone. But Jesus came taking the form of a human being. That's what Paul says. He stripped off his divinity and took the form of a servant and came to this world to reveal the father. So Jesus said to Philip, who has seen me, has seen the father. And you have enough if you see, if you see me. That's all you have to do. So Jesus is the revelation of the father. So how do we connect this with the, with the uh, previous statement? Well, Remember that all the writings of the prophets and their messages and, and, and their prophecies had the intention of reveal the Father, reveal His character, reveal His will, reveal His, um, His plans to the people. But when Jesus came, that was the fullest of all the revelation. That, that was uh, the, the, the completion of all the revelation. Because there was no more to be revealed but Jesus himself. So that's what F.F. Um, F. Bruce says. The, the, the revealing of the Father came in, in a, such a progression up to Jesus Christ. But there is no greater, greater progression beyond him. Because Jesus is the full revelation of the Father. So, if we get that. This is what um, uh, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 says. Jesus is the son and heir. So remember that um, uh, in, in uh, Psalms 2, 8, uh, quoted by, by Paul in, in um, the letter to the Hebrews, he said that Jesus one day will inherit all what has been promised in the past. And he will 
rule over the messianic kingdom. So Jesus is son and heir. So check this out. All the entire letter of the, to the Hebrews is to uh, prove the supremacy of Jesus over all things. Remember that people was losing faith. And then now the, the, the author is trying to bring that confidence back so they can regain their faith and have hope that the, what they believed in Jesus Christ is not a waste in time, but it's an investing because they will receive the reward. So he's saying Jesus is son, the son that was promised, and he also will inherit all the kingdoms of the earth. Jesus, says uh, Paul, is the creator because through him were all things created. But this is also uh, confirmed by John. In, in, in John 1, in the Gospel of John, uh, at the beginning, he says that all things were created by him and through him, and nothing that has been created was made without him. He also, uh, or Paul also confirms this in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, when he said that all things were created by him and that he is the firstborn of creation. And let me uh, explain this to you guys. The word used... Uh, uh, translated as, as firstborn is the Greek word prototokos, which means the first one, the, the, the one that comes out, the first in coming out. That's where the word uh, prototype comes from. And many people have some kind of issues in this case because uh, the word uh, firstborn is, uh, it brings the sense of primo, primogeniture in, in, in it was used for the first uh, son born in a household, okay? And, and many people think that because uh, Paul applies this adjective to Jesus, then it means that Jesus, at some point in time, had a beginning. But that's not what Paul is trying to say, because the firstborn, or, or being the firstborn, also implied having the right to receive all the, not the all, but pretty much, uh, or the majority of the inheritance and be, being the redeemer and also the priest of the family. It's in that sense that Jesus was the firstborn because now he has all the rights of uh, life and death because that's the context of uh, the, the, the writings of Paul to the Colossians. Uh, being the firstborn, of the death because there's there was life in Jesus Christ and, and he came back to life after being crucified and died on the cross so being the firstborn is having the rights of, of all the inheritance that God appointed for this promised son let's go back to this so he's the creator Jesus is the radiance of God's glory so the the radiance is it's is that light that shines and Jesus um, demonstrating being the radiance of God's glory because um, not only because he was um, uh, uh, showing that kind of glory when he was baptized and, and, and the father spoke from heaven saying this is my son in whom I am pleased but also in the transfiguration when there was a, a light shining bright and, and Jesus appeared in the middle of uh, Moses and Elijah, um, um, and, and the voice from heaven was heard again saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am pleased. He is the radiance, so he showed the, the glory of God, or the glory of God shone through him. We can, we can see it that way as well. But also, it says that, Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. We already spoke about this because he's the revelation of the Father. He's the exact representation of the Father. Who has seen me has seen the Father, he said to Philip. Jesus is the sustainer, sustainer of the universe. So um, Jesus not only uh, created everything that exists, including the universe, but also he sustains it. 
every single day, every hour. Nothing happens without his sustaining power because the life exists in him and he is the one who sustains uh, the universe. So let me make a pause here before we continue analyzing all these um, uh, things in which Jesus is uh, uh, better than everything else or superior than everything else. If he is the creator of all things, and also if he is the sustainer of all things, is there something that we should fear about? I guess not. The, 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 the hardest part is to believe that and, 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 to, and, to, and to believe it to the point that I'm not going to worry about anything. But this is where most people struggle because they, they, they are always thinking about um, the sustainment every single day or what, what am I going to do next week or maybe how am I going to make it to, to, to the end of the month. Jesus is the sustainer and there's nothing to fear about what is going to happen today or tomorrow unless we forget about what the Lord has done for us in the past. Okay, let's go back to this. Jesus is the Redeemer because he came to solve a problem that no one else solved. And we'll talk about this. And that's uh, the, the problem of sin. And Jesus is the ruler. We're going to talk about that as well. So, um, talking about the supremacy of Jesus. After making purification, that's what I, I was uh, saying. After making purification for sin, sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. What all this means? Okay. Um, George Knight, in his um, commentary to the uh, epistle to the Hebrews, he says, Christ is better than the angels because he has accomplished things that no angel could ever do. Jesus is better because he solved the, pre, the sin problem. Let's go back to this. After making, this is Hebrews, um, um, the last part of verse 3 and verse 4. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majestic or the majesty on high. So what Paul is saying here is that Jesus is better than the angels. He not only... Um, shows the superiority of Jesus over all things because he created, because he spoke, uh, and because he revealed the Father. But also he said that he's better than the angels because he solved the problem of sin. None of the angels was capable of solving the problem of sin. But Jesus did. How? Dying on the cross and resurrected at the, uh, resurrecting at the third day. So that's why Jesus is superior and is better to the angels but uh, as well jesus is better because he solved the same problem yeah he accomplished things that no angel could ever do like revealing the father in 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 um the the statement uh continues in verse five for to which of the angels did god ever say you are my son today i have begotten you or again i will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son and again paul is quoting here from the book of uh the psalms and in those words were said to uh david in relation to or relating to Solomon and God said he will be like my own son but remember he was not talking about Solomon he implied to Solomon but he was talking about his own son Jesus Christ so now the author of the book uh, the, uh, the author of the uh, letter to the Hebrews says oh, oh when God spoke these words to any of the angels. You are my son and I'm going to be like a father to you. That's what I have begotten you today. He said to none of the angels this word had been said, but to Jesus Christ. So that's why Jesus is better than the angels. So now let's deal with uh, one of the things or, or one of uh, the statements that have caused uh, some issues for those who don't believe that Jesus 
is a is divine and he is God himself. And that's the 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 declaration of Paul saying that uh, or applying this text to Jesus Christ. So that's why I have begotten you today. So that affirmation of Paul has caused many issues for many believing that Jesus is a created being and not having pre-existence life like God the Father. But there is not a time when Jesus has not existed because he is eternal. Eternity has, it's, it's, it's a word that means a, a time which has no beginning or end. And even in the book of a Hebrew, a little bit ahead, I guess chapter 10 or, or chapter 7, uh, the author mentions that Jesus has not beginning of days or end of days. So that means eternity. So there is not a time when Jesus has not existed. But how do we reconcile the fact that uh, Paul says, that's why I have begotten you, quoting from the book of Psalms, and applying it to Jesus Christ? Well, okay, let's, let's try to understand this. Jesus was begotten in the sense that he was installed or adopted by God as the promised ruler, the son of David. The concept of divine adoption of the ruler was common in the great Greek Roman world and the East, it gave the ruler legitimacy and power over the land. So what Paul is saying, he's using terms that are common of that time, that are pretty familiar for the people. So he's putting things into their, their context so they could understand what he was trying to say. So Jesus is begotten in the sense that he was installed as the ruler. Remember that Jesus is superior to any of the angels because after accomplishing the, the, the payment and the, and, and the solution for the sin problem, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. I know this is complex, but let me, let me put it this way. If we go to Revelation chapter 5, then we're going to find the enthronement of Jesus Christ. And that's the chapter that uh, talks about the details of the moment when Jesus sat at the right hand of the Father. Before he did that, John, the revelator, the writer of the book of Revelation, he was weeping because he saw the, the spot, the space at the right of the Father being empty. And there was a scroll in that spot. And he knew that only the Messiah was the appointed one, and he was capable of unsealing the scroll. And seeing the scroll being still sealed, he thought, then the Jesus I met and the Jesus I know is not the Messiah. So then he starts weeping. But at the moment when he is weeping, then Jesus appears in the scene and grabs the scroll. By only doing that, grabbing the scroll, John understood that he was the Messiah. And he was the appointed one to unseal the scroll and open the, all the, the scroll and, 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 and being the ruler of the world. Because if we go to the book of um, Deuteronomy, and it has to be chapters 17 and 18, that's the description of how they were, the people of Israel, were going to um, do the protocol of having a new king, what they, the new king was, uh, all, all the duties of the new king, and one of the duties was to teach the law, and the law was contained in that scroll. So by handing the scroll to the new king, he was officially being the new king, until that, that very, very moment when he grabbed the scroll. So in the moment in Revelation 5, Jesus grabs the scroll, he becomes the new king. 
But in this case, he's in heaven and he sits down at the right hand of the Father. Then the, the, the heaven, the entire heaven sparks in shouting and worshiping the Lamb who has been slain. Because that's the way he got the right of sitting at the right hand of the Father by being slain and paying for the problem of sin. Do you get that? So now, when, when, when um, the book of uh, Hebrews says that Jesus was begotten in the sense that he was installed or adopted by God as the promised ruler, is the promised son that was going to be the ruler that the promise made to uh, King David, the son of David. Jesus was a descendant of David. He was called the son of David. We know that. The concept of divine adoption of the ruler was common in the Greco-Roman world and in this. And he gave the ruler legitimacy, power, or le yeah, and power over the land. So Jesus, in the mind of the, of the Hebrew people, the Jewish people at the time, uh, they received the letter, has a new dimension. All things become kind of clear to, to them because Jesus is superior in everything. So now they see how Jesus is the creator, how God has spoken through Jesus. So Jesus being God, he speaks. That brings assurance to them. That brings hope. So now they see that Jesus not only did all that, but when he ascended to heaven, he sat at the right hand of the Father. They say, wow, he is the ruler of the world. He received all the kingdoms of the earth and also the entire universe to be ruled by King. Let's go back to the temptation of Jesus. Satan said, if you worship me, I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of the earth because I own them and I give them to whoever I want. Jesus didn't worship Satan because he knew that in order to get all that, to recover the dominion and the ruling that was lost when Adam and Eve sinned, he had to pay. And the payment and the wages was his own death on the cross. So after paying for that, then he sat down at the right hand of the Father and he received all the dominion and all the power and all the ruling because he paid with his own son, own, own life. So... Now, the people of, uh, of, of uh, the first century, they started to grasp what Paul was talking about uh, with all these things. So, Scripture calls only one person's son. Thus, Jesus does indeed have a better name than the angels. Because to none of the angels, God called them son. But Jesus, he is the son of God. We know that. A title never ascribed to the angelic beings. A unique relationship exists between God the Father and Jesus the Son. A relationship shared with none of the angels. In that sense, Jesus is superior to the angels. Well, he's superior to the angels in everything. Because there is not a time... In eternity, when Jesus has not been superior to the angels. We know, because if be, he's God, being God, he has to be superior to the angels. But for many people, this is it's, it's an issue, and this creates some kind of a misunderstanding, some kind of confusion. So Paul is trying to clarify things. He's trying to make things clear so they can get it a little bit easier. And I'm going to end with this. The coming of Jesus to this earth as the Son of God fulfilled several functions at the same time. In the first place, as the divine Son of God, Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. We spoke already of that. Through his actions and words, Jesus showed us what the Father really is like and why we can trust and obey him. Okay? So all those things were fulfilled. Um, when Jesus came to this world. But one of the things, probably the most important one for us today, is that Jesus, uh, with his own sacrifice, fulfilled or, or, or actually solved 
the problem of sin. Because he was the lamb and the priest at the same time. Remember that in the book of Hebrews we are going to see how the ministry, the priestly ministry of Jesus is superior to any other priest on earth. So, being crucified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he was the Lamb, but presenting his own blood in the heavenly sanctuary, he became a priest of a superior ministry or, or a superior priesthood. And that's how he solved the sin problem. And that's what I said. Probably that's the most important thing that was fulfilled uh, through Jesus for us today. Why? Because one of the things that we struggle with is sin. And we have never stopped. Uh, there, there is not a time when we haven't struggled because of sin. All the time we're struggling with sin. Not because we are um, trying to find how other ways to sin but because we were born sinners and we need a savior. So in that sense, Jesus became the, the lamb and also the savior. So what we have to do today is just accept Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. And believe that he is God himself. He created all things and God revealed himself through Jesus Christ. So let's surrender every day to him. So that's what we have to do. And, and, and he is going to give us the hope that we need for this time. Because in the same way that people in the first century had doubts, today with so many information, with so many things, we, sometimes we, 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 we lost track of all those things and, and, and we start to have some doubts. We start doubting, uh, is he really coming? After all 2,000 years that have gone through, Already, is he really coming back? Uh, is is the, the, the Holy Spirit a real person or is not? All those things become more and more um, um, uh, a, a bigger doubt sometimes uh, that grows and grows in our mind. And, and we start doubting. We start doubting things that we had believed. We are going through the same situation that the Hebrew people lived 2,000 years ago. So that's why we need to review the letter to the Hebrews. So then we can have the assurance and the hope that we need for this time. So I hope that this uh, lesson preview may be helpful as you study through this week and also as you teach. Let's have a word of prayer and, and let's finish with this. Heavenly Father, thank you for such a wonderful uh, letter that through Paul, you sent to the people of uh, the first century. Um, that brought assurance to them. And it's uh, uh, amazing the fact that still brings assurance to us today. In a time when faith uh, seems kind of uh, uh, silly uh, in, the, in the eyes of other people, in a time when um, being a Christian sometimes uh, looks kind of uh, weird for, for most of the world, uh, we want to strengthen our faith. And that can happen through the Word. Because that's what the Bible says. Faith comes by reading and by listening to your Word. So we want to uh, be more familiar with what you have said uh, about all these things, and we want to strengthen our faith. We want a faith uh, strong enough to overcome all the doubts and to keep us uh, firm and, and keep us standing in the middle of, of all these uh, uh, doubts and in the middle of the attacks against your, your, your word and attacks against even uh, against the, the divinity of Jesus and also of the Holy Spirit. Help us to be um, in the side of the truth, always, and whenever we have doubts, come back to your word in order to listen to you, speaking to us directly, and, and, and take away our doubts. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.